everybody. Welcome to Inside Quest. Our goal is to take you inside the minds of the world's most effective thinkers so that you guys can learn with ease what they usually learn with great difficulty. And I promise if you pay attention, uh, our guests will teach you to acquire the behaviors and thought patterns that you're going to need to be successful no matter what you're trying to accomplish in your life. Today's guest is a seriously OG blogger who was blogging before blogging was a thing, and she has woven herself into the very fabric of the design and DIY communities through her prolific writing. She's been a contributing editor or freelancer for a litany of some of the most recognizable names in the industry, including House and Garden, In Style, and New York Magazine. And her website, oh, her website, Design Sponge, which has been going for over a decade at this point, was dubbed the Martha Stewart Living for Millennials by the New York Times. She's awesome, man, because she really reaches beyond the surface aesthetic and finds the deeper meaning and human connection behind the design. And this remarkably personal approach has made her unbelievably successful. She's built the Design Sponge social ecosystem into a vibrant and thriving community that reaches over 1.5 million people per day. That is insane. And with a relatively small team, she's having a massive impact on the world of design. And she's doing it by focusing on spreading her company's values, as well as simply making the world a more beautiful place. She inspires me because she is constantly learning and reinventing herself, and that broad experience gives her collective works a seriously unique vitality. Some of her eclectic highlights include working as a style editor, doing her own podcast, writing multiple books, and publishing a newspaper. Uh, she is a force of nature, truly, guys, who is fearlessly herself. And this trait, coupled with her authentic, approachable demeanor, has seen her featured everywhere from Good Morning America to The Martha Stewart Show. So please, please help me in welcoming the author of In the Company of Women, inspiration and advice from over 100 makers, artists, and entrepreneurs, the founder of the glorious juggernaut, Design Sponge, Grace Bonney. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, you, even in, in all the words in the world, I don't think I could really capture the, um, the eclectic person that you are. And that's something that really, I think, has fed your community and is where I want to start. So I'm going to try to get <laughs> us there, so bear with me. I was talking to you about this off camera. When you're researching somebody, you really get to see a compressed evolution of that person. Uh, and it's been fascinating to watch you go from the early days as a startup blogger to where you are now. And the, the moment that I found most interesting was your openness in handling uh, being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And it was in that moment in the way that you responded to the difficulty of changing identity. And change is something you've, you talk really powerfully about all through your career, and it's fun to watch that change. But talk to me about how do you deal with a changing identity? It's really difficult. And I don't think there is one correct way to do it. I think I'm always course correcting in what feels like the appropriate way to deal with something difficult, or even something great, just a large change. And I think when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, it it really kind of felt like a slamming door. Like here's the end of the grace you knew before and I'm gonna have to shove this new door open and figure out what this new version of life is like. And, and I wasn't very good at it at first. I really, really stumbled. I had three months of just like crying on the floor and trying to figure out how I pick up and move on and what would this mean for my life going forward? Did it have long-term health complications? How do I correct that? Can I correct that? Um, it was really scary, but then I thought about it the way I thought about every other challenge I've had at work, which was you just have to let yourself sit in the muck and just be in it because there is no way to push yourself out of it. You kind of just have to let yourself go through all the stages of grief and difficulty and then just slowly let yourself come out of it. And when I did, I felt calmer and I felt stronger and I still wish I didn't have type one, but it's, it's a challenge that weirdly feels familiar to me because with type one, there's never a set way of doing things that will always work forever. You're always adjusting, whether it's insulin levels or the doctors you have to see or all of these different things, it's constantly changing. And we were talking about before, the internet is constantly changing. And so I learned from work that there's just no place where you can sit still and be, you know, peace out, I'm done. I can just have the same thing forever, it's cool. 
that doesn't exist. So when I kind of made that connection between the lessons I'd learned in business and what I would learn from a health challenge like this, it kind of clicked and made sense. Yeah, I loved watching um, the themes like in your writing. A blog that's gone on as long as yours is like a time capsule or a, a diary almost, especially because you're so real and authentic. And watching you um, talk about change from the perspective of a businesswoman who's just in the throes of unimaginable success. I mean, really, for anybody that hasn't touched um, her ecosystem before, it is massive. I mean, massive, massive, massive. And when you see the numbers on Pinterest, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, the website itself, it, it really is astonishing. So you, you see that version of what change looks like from a, a position of well-earned confidence. And then all the way to being able to admit that, you know, I'm going to take a few months, I'm going to sit on the floor and cry for a minute. <laughs> you know, but then, and then you walk your readers through the process of picking yourself back up. If you would, tell, what is that, like when you're on the floor crying, part of you must know I'm going to work my way to standing up again. What is that mental process for you? Um, I think so much of it is rooted in the idea of taking the time you need to fully process something. I think living online and especially, I'm not of the generation of bloggers who came into their blogs fully formed as a brand. Right. I came into it thinking, this will be a great way to get another job in a more stable <laughs> industry at some point. Like the magazine uh, Yeah, industry. and then I went to those and then they all closed. And at first I thought it was my fault and then I realized it was just the industry. Um, but when you, when you realize the thing that you thought would be your, your stable point changes, you just look at things a little bit differently. Um, but I, I think in general, sort of learning to change identities and learning to embrace something that's new, it's just very much about being calm and being quiet. And the internet has taught me to talk a lot, but I think challenges like this teach me to be quiet even more. And in those- And is that quiet so you can hear an inner voice or? It's hear an inner voice, it's hear other people's voices of experience, people who've been through the same thing before or something similar. And um, whether it's like changing your business model or in my case, like going through a divorce and then coming out of the closet and these like big, big moments that happen no one figures them out on their own. And so for me, it was very much about stop talking, stop writing about, you know, your voice doesn't need to be heard right now. You need to listen to someone else who understands what this is. And so when it came to type one and talking about that publicly, I very much needed a few months of just listening to other people. And I was joining like countless private Facebook groups, just trying to find people who've been living with this for a long time to hear that it was gonna be okay. And I just heard enough of that eventually that it kind of just became a tipping point of, okay, I see the other side, I know how this will move forward, and I'll do my best like I always do, and that's all I can do. Now, one thing that I noticed that cropped up in your life over and over and over was a relentless focus on the positive, um, where you could be talking about anything, whether it's type one, and, and you've certainly made that transition in the writing to seeing the optimism and what, what I've learned and all of that stuff. In fact, you did like a seven bullet point what I've learned from <laughs> type one diabetes, which was all like this wildly optimistic. We're even saying like the body's an amazing thing. Yes. It's like, wait a second, here's somebody who's in the throes of type one diabetes, right? Which is, hey, the pancreas just totally shuts down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the body's really letting you down. So for one of the things for you to learn through all of that is the body's this amazing thing and it allows us to carry around these great minds and you start talking about all these amazing people that you'd interacted with. How much of that is, did you learn it as a kid? Is it a tool you've developed? Like, how'd you end up there? Um, I definitely did not learn that as a kid. I, I was a very like angry, angsty 90s kid. Um, and I think it really wasn't until I kind of got the chip knocked off my shoulder a bunch of times, whether it was in college or really figuring out what it meant to run a business online and all of the hurdles I encountered where I realized, okay, no one's perfect. You can choose to move forward with this and make it, or let it make you bitter, or you can choose to try to find to learn something out of it. And if nothing else, life gives you constant challenges and chances to fall on your face. And it just seemed silly not to try to at least learn something from that moment. So. I try to be positive. I think sometimes I'm not as positive as I, I wish I could be, but I do feel proud that I do try to take all those hurdles as moments to learn something about myself or the people that I work with. 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting, and if I had to guess, well, I can tell you what it's like from the outside. That I can do objectively. The other is going to be me guessing. Uh, from the outside, you are offering people um, a positive anchor in this storm that you're going through. And while I'm sure internally it, you're maybe discounting the positivity that you put out into the world because you know how much of the negativity is, is your own mind, yeah. um, but your ability and foresight to know, I need to find something, even if it feels a little fake in the beginning, I'm going to put that out into the world. And then, it, you know, I mean, just reading the comments on your blogs, it actually then comes back to you in this loop because the framing that you put out into the world is so positive that you really invite that into your world, and um, it's pretty cool. It's, it's true that what you put out there generally does come back to you for the most part. I mean, I still have a lot of people who just want to yell at me about <laughs> what I wear, what my hair looks like, or any of those sorts of things. But I've found that the more honestly vulnerable that I can be when I'm ready to, not and rushing in any way, but the more honestly vulnerable I can be on the internet, even in small ways, just encourages people to do the same. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there will be a thousand other design blogs that come after mine that are bigger or more popular or with younger, shinier people. And at the end of the day, the real heart that I take home from my job are those conversations that happen with people. And whether it's about type one or just the struggles of keeping a business exciting and fresh and still relevant after 12 years, those conversations via email or in person, that's the fuel that keeps me going because, you know, internet numbers are great and, you know, being able to pay your bills, that's great. But I really, I really thrive and run on those conversations and being able to have, even if it's just a split second of realness with somebody, that's what keeps me going. It's interesting. So uh, you posted something that I really resonated with and you said, uh, I'm going to paraphrase here, don't be trapped by your success, right? You might do something, it may do well, but if it doesn't make you feel more alive, if, if it feels like it really drained you and at the end of that you're just exhausted, like, don't do it. Even if it's posting big numbers, it's your best post ever, yeah. uh, but it made you feel drained, don't do it. Um, is that something you learned the hard way? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think you can be a blogger of, of any genre who blogs for this long, who hasn't made all the wrong decisions before you figure out the right ones, at least the right ones for now. And I think I learned how to set boundaries by not setting them at first. And I learned how to phrase things online in a way that felt comfortable for me by not phrasing them correctly at first. Um, that, that's a hard lesson to learn. And you can't learn it without just spectacularly doing it wrong a million times. Yeah, yes. As, uh, as somebody deep in the throes of all those mistakes right there with you, I, I understand that completely. Um, there's a story that I want to, before we move off of transitioning and identity and all that, um, that I'd love for you to tell. I think I wrote down the exact quote, and this is so, like, this was so powerful for me. All right, so this was at your senior um, portfolio review. Oh. And you're, think about this, you're getting a degree in art. You have to present your portfolio. Your teachers, who have a significant amount of authority and power over you, they tell you what they think. And this is what her teacher said, right while she's standing there. This is awful. You'll never be an artist. You're never going to work in the art industry, and you don't have any talent. How, how do you bounce <laughs> back from that? I was like, I wanted to lay on the floor and cry. I was like, <laughs> it's like that. Yeah. And it wasn't even aimed at me. So like. What do you do with that? You cry a lot in the hallway <laughs> with your other teachers. Um, it's funny, that moment, I'd forgotten about that moment, but it really, for the first like five years of running Design Sponge, informed so many of the decisions I made because I felt a need to prove myself, not, not even as a fine artist, because I think I knew as a fine art major that was not going to be what I ended up doing. I just wanted to be around art, and I thought I had a good eye, and I had no idea what to do with that. And I went to a, a wonderful school, but just a liberal arts school where, you know, interior design and product design or even just criticism in the larger sense wasn't an option. So I cobbled together what I could in fine arts and art history and some writing stuff. And all of that ended up making sense with Design Sponge, but I didn't know it then. And ultimately that professor was right. And I realize that now. I really wish she had said that in a different way. <laughs> um, I wish she had pulled me aside and said, you know, I've seen this before. I think. You're, you're pushing in the wrong direction, but I think he felt like I was wasting his time and that there were a lot of students who would go on to be painters or sculptors and he could tell I was just doing my best, but it just wasn't good enough. Um, so I don't know, I, I think in some way I'm really glad he said that because 
it gave me the motivation I needed to try to prove him wrong and then ultimately realize I didn't need to prove him wrong. I just needed to figure out where my place was. And for me, I couldn't find it. I had to build it. And there was no pre-made job or place where I truly felt at home. And it wasn't until I built Design Sponge that I realized, oh, I'm, I'm building the community and the support system that I need. And I have to cobble that together from people all over the world. And I'll do a little bit of my own artwork and I'll do a lot of writing and I'll do all these different things that together make sense. But we're never going to be the traditional fine art career that I maybe thought I could have. Um, but man, in the moment, that was not fun. That was really, really rough. And I thankfully had another professor who was my printmaking teacher who came up to me and said, he's wrong, you're gonna be okay. I don't think this is what you're gonna end up doing, but you're gonna do something wonderful. And that little moment of just someone having a little bit of faith in me was kind of all I needed. And I just packed up, I moved to New York City the next day and hit the ground running and have literally never looked back. We gotta talk about that. So, <laughs> that is, that is a nearly superhuman feat to me. So you've just completed this degree, which getting into the college, you'd already transferred colleges, you go there, you think you're gonna be a journalism major, only to find out, hey, I didn't even ask if they have a journalism degree, and they don't. <laughs> uh, so now I have to figure something else out. You go into fine art, which is your uh, passion, and you get to the end of it, and you get that most hateful and aggressive quote, but the next day, you still have the guts to take on the most terrifying city in the world, the place where they say, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And they say that because it eats people alive. Uh, you make your dad drive you there the very next day. You show up in Brooklyn, and you start building something. Mm -hmm. So off the back of somebody telling you, like, you're never going to work in this town, kid, and you, uh, you say, well, then I will build my own monolith. Like, that's so nuts. It's so courageous that it that when i heard that story that's when i stopped in my tracks and i was like all right this person knows something amazing like and and how you're able to um forge that into something beautiful so for all the people out there who either have already been kicked like that will get kicked in the future um what's the soothing process that you went through to to move to something beautiful, even if the soothing process is, I'm gonna tell this guy, right? And I know that was mm -hmm. part of it, but what, what is that soothing process to, to find enough courage and self-confidence to move forward? What's interesting, because you're saying the word soothing, and in my head I'm hearing the word seething, because I think sometimes that process of moving forward is fueled by nurturing and, and understanding and finding a good place, and sometimes I am so fueled by just wanting to prove someone wrong. I love it. But I am somebody who is so, so motivated by someone not believing I can do something, whether it's start a business or, and I remember when all the magazines folded in like the late 2000s and everyone saying like, well, you're gonna have to go find some office job now because there's no way you can make that blog work. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, oh really? Like, go ahead, challenge me because that is exactly what I'll do. And so it starts sometime in that kind of angsty place of someone telling me I can't do something and then wanting to make it happen. Um, but I think the soothing process tends to happen when I find people who've been through something similar. And if you're working with independent artists, you're in a really good place to find people who understand what it feels like to not be able to make ends meet, to not be able to get their first, second, or third project to be successful. It's just, it's a group of people who understand what it feels like to do things on your own. And so luckily, when I moved to Brooklyn, that's a borough full of people doing things on their own. And without knowing it, I very much plugged into that first generation of makers and artists and designers who were gonna do everything with their own two hands from the business aspect to the creation aspect. And finding those people to spend time around was just a very positive group of people who could encourage you to push past failure or push past doubt. And that was really, really important to me. Mm. Can we dap it out on the anger? Yes, yes. So this, this is something, <laughs> this is, people get weird when you talk about this, but you're gonna give me an in because I have an angry neutral face, right? A resting bitch face. Oh, yes. So when I talk about being angry, people are like, yeah, of course he's angry. <laughs> um, <laughs> which actually is not what resides in my soul, by the way. But when somebody who's brought so much beauty into the world, and I mean, you just look at your website, and it's, it's beauty on the surface, and it's beauty as you dig in and realize you really, I mean, you can really feel you trying to find the thing beyond the aesthetic that's real and people can connect with, and it's actually gonna make their world and, and the world at large a better place. To hear you say that, look, part of the recovery period is to 
get angry, is to be seething, raging mad. And it's, um, it's one of those uncomfortable, inconvenient truths that I think is worth talking about. And, you know, when I look at what I've done in my own life and, and you know, the great Jay-Z lyric that reminds me of how I felt, and he said, I'm in the penthouse, claw your way up. Mm. And, you know, that's, that was the kind of thing that I needed. And a lot of times it was spurred by being so angry because nobody thought that I could do it or nobody made me feel like anything I was doing was of value. But you, you have that trigger in you where it's legitimate. Like, you, now I'm mad. Now I'm mad and I have two choices. I can stamp that down and woosah, find a, you know, a nice, centered, yeah. happy place, yeah. which is very powerful and people need to know how to do yeah. that. But then there's also times where you got to be like, all right, I'm fucking pissed yeah. and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to come out. I'm like, I've been backed into a corner. I'm going to rage and that has its place. And I mm -hmm. think people are afraid to use the whole gamut of human emotion. But like there is that, mm -hmm. there is an intoxication in true anger that people can leverage to do the incredible. It's my maybe not best from a writing standpoint, but my most effective writing happens when I'm angry because it's that point that spurs me to throw caution to the wind, to speak straight from my heart, and to say something exactly the way I want to say it. And so often when you live online, you're used to really carefully and detailed, like overthinking everything you say to say, what's the best way I can say this to piss off the fewest amount of people? And that's a big part of my job because I don't run a website that's controversial or you know, negative. And so I really do try to think about how can I say this in a way that makes people feel a part of the conversation and not judged or not angry. But every now and then something will set me off. And in that little spark of a moment, you do get the greatest response because you're just putting it out there. And you do get a lot of kickback too when you're not you know, super filtered. But I love those moments. If I can't find that realness in, in any other, whether it's a website or a magazine or a television show or whatever, I get bored. And I, I, want, I want to see those little sparks of fire. I think those are good moments. And people don't expect them from people in my community so much because I think the face of the design community is so often like a really happy young blonde girl. And that sort of look is great and fine. But that's not who I am, and I think everyone expects me to be like a human cupcake and like, <laughs> like just really like sparkly and happy all the time. And not that I'm not happy, but my version of happiness is not that. So it's it's sometimes just a shift of showing people. Yeah, I, I literally had some one time someone pulled me over to trade show, and she was like, "You are so much black. You're so intimidating." And I was like, "Really?" She was like, "I just really thought you'd be like in a bright pink dress." And I was like, well, I, I do like pink, and that's, that's great, and I have worn pink dresses before, but that's like, not how I'm most comfortable. And she's like, oh, it's a little disappointing. Oh, <laughs> ouch. Yeah, but I mean. You are not who I want you to be. Yeah, yeah. but that's, that's the reality of living online, wow. is that someone, you know, people build up an idea. And I do the same thing with the people that I follow and read online, is I imagine them to be a certain way, and then when it's slightly different, there's an adjustment. Mm. Um, and I think because I mean, obviously, my, my version of being known on the internet is so small compared to a lot of people, but even the things I encounter meeting people, they're so comfortable to tell me exactly what they think about me as if I'm not a real yeah. person. Um, so I think sometimes that lack of filter lets me feel a little bit more comfortable with being slightly less filtered on Divine Sponge. Yeah, I can, I can get that. It's, um, man, it's crazy that, uh, that people say stuff like that. It's weird because you feel like you know them in some ways, right? And you've never met them. Um, and then you can sort of begin to close them into a box. But with you in particular, I'm a little surprised because as I was doing, as I was doing the research, like every time I thought I had you, okay, I know who she is. I know what this interview is going to be. We're good. Yeah, we can roll. Let's go. Then you'd be like, oh yeah. And the Screaming uh, Females are, is my favorite band. And I was like, oh, let me look them up. I've never heard of them. And you start playing their music, and you're like, okay, well, that wasn't what I expected. And then in the next breath, you'll do an interview, and somebody's like, oh, what are you listening to right now? And it was like 90s hip hop. And I was like, what, what is going on? It was like Little Kim, DeBrat, and someone else. I'd never heard the song. Ladies Night. Ladies Come Night. On. So I put it on, and I'm like, okay, another unexpected one. So I go through your list, and it was like the, 
uh, the dismemberment plan or something like that. I was like, who is this woman? So uh, just amazing, amazingly eclectic. So I'm, I'm very surprised people managed to fit you in a box. <laughs> well, I think a lot of times that's my fault. I think, I think living online, I do choose to put certain things about myself online and certain things I keep to myself, whether or not that's like a conscious choice. Like I don't write about the music I listen to so much online because I don't run a music blog, so it doesn't come up as much. Um, but I do, I find, I, I lived in Portland briefly um, in Oregon for a summer and I went to go see like some sort of, you know, post-punk riot girl type band and I had a girl come up to me, you know, in this like dark, like smoky club and she was like, are you the girl from Design Spot? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah. And she was like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I just thought like, I'm doing the same thing you're doing. Like I'm <laughs> listening to like an awesome band and this is great. And I think there's just sometimes people, they want to think of you as one way. And, and it is sometimes easier as a, as a brand to mm. really kind of put this one version of yourself out because it's cleaner and neater yes. and easier to understand. And so I think I started a podcast a few years ago as part of a way to have these like longer form conversations that would allow me to be a more fully realized human being. And it attracted a very different audience of people who who liked that I liked different things or who weren't interested in the design part of my life but were interested in the business part or my weird fascination with horror movies or whatever it was. And so I think as I've gotten older and as the business has progressed, it's been so much more fulfilling because the newer readers or followers of the site are interested in a more fully formed version of me or the brand in general. And that's really very rewarding. Yeah, and I want to believe that that's been a big part of why you've been so successful because that's that's present in your earliest writings, right? The, all the little surprises, the things that I don't expect, the the pushing for more, hearing you struggle with, I don't want this to just be um, about aesthetic, I want it to be something deeper, starting a, a scholarship, she has a scholarship, like, I th you started the scholarship before it was had really taken off, so I'm like... Yeah. Wow, she's, you know, no office, no, uh, I don't even know if you had employees at that point, but I have a scholarship, uh, which is incredible. Um, what is that inward looking, relentless quest, and not for perfection, because you've been very clear that that doesn't exist, but, but that um, hunger to evolve, where does that come from? Um, when you're talking about the scholarship in particular, it brings up a point for me that I think is, is a big driving force in my life, which is kind of a recognition of privilege and realizing that even in my toughest times, I've still been able to pay my bills doing what I love. And that's not something most people get to do for a wide number of reasons. And I think even when I started the scholarship, I paid for it myself. And I never even thought of getting a sponsor. I just thought, I cannot believe I can sort of pay all of my bills <laughs> through this blog. I don't have any business having this money. And it, I mean, we're not talking about a lot of money, but I had like a couple extra thousand dollars. And I thought, I don't feel right having this. Somebody else should have this. Wow. And, and then I realized that was a terrible business decision. <laughs> um, and I've made those decisions over and over where I think about the passion behind it before I think about the funding. And I've repeated that error many times. But with the scholarship, I recognized that there were so many young kids, I mean, like really like middle school kids who didn't even know what like graphic design was or product design was. And I wanted to be able to fund the next generation of people to do what they wanted to do without restrictions. And so many scholarships are very, they come with a lot of red tape and they come with a lot of this can only be used for this specific purpose. And I think creativity happens in the gray space. It happens when you have the funding to take an unpaid internship or you have a little bit of money to take a road trip and discover something new. And I wanted to fund those moments. And so that's where my scholarship came from, which was very much about, it's not a ton of money, but it's enough money for you to maybe even just try new materials and buy stuff you didn't have the money to experiment with before. And maybe in that moment, you'll discover you're really good at or love that one thing. And so I think I've always been fueled by wanting to share whatever wealth, whether that's financial or emotional or just community wealth with other people, because there's nothing fun about running a business and feeling like you're up on a hill by yourself. There's, what's the point? That, I mean, for me, that does nothing. So if I can't bring other people up with me or expand that platform to give other people a place to talk, it just feels so self-serving that 
I, it just doesn't feel right to me. So I think that desire to kind of always bring people into a wider circle has been something that's fueled every project, whether it's the book or a podcast or what a, an event series, whatever we've done over the last 12 years, it's very much been about trying to bring in the greatest amount of people into this happy space we've created. So you know the young upstarts right now, they're gonna work mm -hmm. round the clock, they're gonna go to all the shows, they're gonna yeah. do all that, they're gonna use their youth to grind it out. Um, what do you have in the way of advice for them to, to both do the things they need to do to launch their career, but to not lose sight of, at the end of the day, fulfillment is the only thing that's gonna bring you any lasting happiness? Well, I think the hard thing is when you're 21 and you're grinding it out, you don't care about fulfillment. Like, that's just not, that's not, or at least that wasn't where my head was at that age. It was very much about, I like want to support myself. I don't want to have to get a nine to five job. I don't have to work in a cubicle. How much work do I have to do to make that a reality? And then what can I do that's fun, that lets me travel, that lets me meet the people I admire? And for me, writing for magazines was very much about just, I want to meet these designers that I think are so cool. Here's a vehicle to do that. I wasn't thinking about like, will this make me happy as a person? Will this, what will happen in 10 years? It was just very much about like, cool, I can pay my rent and do this fun job. So I'm gonna do that until the wheels fall off and that's gonna be great. Um, and I think when I turned like 27 or 28, I started thinking, oh, okay, like there needs to be a greater purpose here. And I started looking more into that. But I feel like your 20s and those early days of like figuring out your business, I don't think there are rules. And I think if someone had given me a set of rules or, or lessons to learn from at 21, I would have like crumpled them up and like thrown them over my shoulder and been like, I will write my own rules. <laughs> so I think it depends on who you are. I think there are a lot of people who are responsible and forward thinking young people running businesses. And for them, I would very much just say, no one will ever have your business um, top of mind the way you do. And I got so much bad advice in the beginning from people that looking back, it was very clearly about feeling threatened and them telling me, oh, don't do that. That's a terrible idea. But it was a really good idea, but it was an idea that maybe would have made me a competitor. Right. And so I think looking back, I realized I was the only person I could really trust in those early days. And, and now I can't run a business like that. Like the idea of me being the only person I consult 12 years in is ludicrous because I don't know everything. And now I know more about how much I don't know. But when you're 22, like you think you know everything. And that was how I ran my business. And thank God someone finally told me like, hey, you're not the end all be all. You don't know everything. And I think that's, that's an important lesson to learn like in your mid to late 20s. What's crazy though is I don't, you could say that's the, that same person could say that same thing to a thousand people and so few of them would respond like you do. And it's the same thing that triggered me with the teacher story is to be able to take a negative and turn it into a positive to find either the, you know, the, the anger enough to push yourself forward or just to um, fuel your confidence to I'm going to show these people. Um, but being able to see beyond the people that are trying to strip you down intentionally or unintentionally mm -hmm. to get to a goal is, is incredible enough, but then to also be able to listen to criticism and say, hey, there's actually something here, right? And so when you said, when we were talking about the teacher, when you said, you know, I I'm actually glad he said it, and he was right, like that you can, that you can admit that he's right. How do you do that? Because it's so, it, it requires a knock to your self-esteem. Well, you wait 10 years, <laughs> and then <laughs> you realize he was right. Um, no, I, I, I think it's, you commiserate with people that understand what it feels like to hear stuff like that. And that does what, lets your guard down so that you can be open to the message? I, th I think when you realize everybody gets criticism like that, that, there's not a single person who has never heard them, someone tell them like, you could do this better. And for mm. me, that's been having friends who are bloggers because no one really understands, maybe, maybe like actors understand in the same way what it's like to live somewhat publicly and have people judge every single aspect of what you do. Um, that's a really difficult thing to understand because then you still have to go online and do the things that make those people happy. Right. And that's a really difficult place to be because if someone tells me they hate whatever I'm doing and that my face is stupid and I hate my writing, it's not my natural inclination to go back and figure out how to make that person happier and how to create content that makes them feel happy because my natural inclination is to just, you know, <laughs> move on. <laughs> but, but that's not what it is to work on the internet. If you just tell everyone, like, fuck off, you don't have a job anymore. Right. And so it's really forced me to like 
lower my ego a lot, which was good, um, and to really listen to other people more. And for the most part, the criticism I get is coming from a good place. Um, and it's really easy to tell when it's not. I think a lot of times when you have someone give you really, really difficult feedback, you can see projection happening or someone feeling threatened or someone just coming from an experience where it didn't go well for them. And so I can feel that when that happens, but I can also feel genuine support and concern and it makes it a little bit easier to take it in. And I'm not good at criticism right away. Like it takes me a day or two to really kind of see that someone's right and let it sink in. Um, but a day or two now versus like 10 years to get my professor's feedback yeah. is it's a good improvement. That, I think that's one of the most powerful skills that anyone can learn is to separate the message from the messenger, mm -hmm. right? So okay, maybe it was delivered poorly, aggressively, it made me feel this, made me feel that, and, and I think everybody has to take a little bit of time to adjust, but your willingness to look through it, to find the nugget of gold, like one thing I, I tell people all the time is, one of the secrets to my success was people were throwing criticism at me all the time. You're dumb, you don't know what you're doing. Um, and at first I saw them as rocks, mm -hmm. and I was, I was being hit with rocks. And so what's your instinct when somebody's throwing rocks at you? You're gonna build up a wall, you're gonna build exactly. a shield. And so now the rocks are hitting the shield. And then one day I thought, wait a second, what if what they're throwing at me are actually nuggets of gold? Then I have to lower my defenses. I have to take the shot to the head, and it's mm -hmm. gonna suck, and it's gonna hurt. Uh, it may even draw blood, but then at my feet is a nugget of gold, and all I have to do then is pick that up, and I'm a little bit richer for it. And just switching that metaphor from it's a rock to it's a nugget of gold, they, they hurt the same. Yeah. Uh, but one has value beyond that initial thing. And, and just sort of repeating that in my head, like these are nuggets of gold, they're nuggets of gold, allowed me to do what you're talking about, which is lower your um, ego mm -hmm. so that you can actually be open to it. And the irony is it builds a bigger business, right? It does. And when you have that shield up, you're blocking all the good stuff too. And that good stuff is what keeps most of us going. So. I think it was good for me to realize that for all the things that came at me that were difficult to deal with, like there were always going to be one or two that were helpful and nice. And so and I do think those things tend to balance out, at least in my experience. Yeah, that's, uh, that is super poignant and useful advice. How do you go from it being a nice big brick wall to being a screen? Like, are there um, behavioral changes that you make, uh, daring just to be present and mm -hmm. commenting again? What does that look like? I think for me, it looked like a, a lot of therapy <laughs> and figuring out what it, what it meant to truly be vulnerable because if I'm presenting this like idealized version of vulnerable grace, that's not real. That's, that's still rounding off all the edges. And I think people can tell when you do that. And, and there was this big thing that happened in the design blog community, which is a very insular niche. And there was this moment where everyone participated in this trend of share something you're embarrassed for someone or ashamed. Ashamed was the word, which I thought was a very interesting word choice, but it was share something that you are ashamed for other people to know about you. And some people shared incredibly deep, deep things about feeling racism in their community or not feeling like strong enough as a working mom. And it's really tough stuff. And then a lot of people just said, I work in my pajamas. Right. And that's, that's not something to be ashamed of, and it's not a real vulnerability. It's, it's like a cute, adorable version of vulnerability. And that drives me nuts because it, I feel like it's playing with people's emotions. And I feel like if you're really gonna put yourself out there and be open and be vulnerable, be real about it. Like really lay it on the line because there will be someone who knows exactly what that feels like. And they will feel more at home and more comfortable in their lives having read that. And even if it's only five people out of 5,000 that read it, it is so worth it in that moment to not sugarcoat it. Um, so I try to keep that in mind a lot. That's really interesting how people, they're so hungry to connect. And I can't think of anything to cheer somebody up more, make them feel connected more than to have somebody that they admire admit to a similar, what they perceive as a fault or you know something. Um, it, the things that really, really embarrass me are always the things people throw back at me as like, oh man, me too, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's never the stuff I think is cool about myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's always like, uh, yeah, ridiculous stuff like how poorly I scored on my SATs and I was really trying, like this was not like, I. oh, I'm a poor test taker. Nope, I just didn't know the information. Yeah. 
And when you so. can get those moments that are that are real and legitimate and not like Schadenfreude, like I do think there are some people who are like, oh, good, she screwed that up too. Did like you say Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. What does that mean? German student. Nice. <laughs> Break it down. I'm yeah. about to learn. It's, it's when go. you genuinely sort of take pleasure in someone else's um, struggle or Schadenfreude. difficulty. Schadenfreude. 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 Yeah. That's awesome. And it's you. like if someone trips and falls and you're like kind of happy that it happened. And Schadenfreude. I just, you know, I think people feel that towards like movie celebrities a lot right. or it's like, oh, someone dumped them. Like, good. I'm glad that right. happened. And that, that's a terrible thing to do to anyone. And I think there's a lot of that with people who live online where they think like, oh, she messed that up. And they're not happy because they connect with and understand that. They're happy because they don't want you to have the perceived happiness they think you do. Um, and that's that's a difficult thing to process because that's a very real feeling for a lot of people who read, especially lifestyle bloggers. The word lifestyle is blah. But I think a lot of people think everyone's like happy, shiny, big house, lots of cars, like everything's perfect. Right. And so they want you to fall. They want something bad to happen. And so rather than diminishing the success, whatever that is that you've earned, I think it's important to just be vulnerable in the moments when you can. And it's, you know, pick those moments and be real about them and don't don't sugarcoat them. I love that. Talk to me about fear. Like this was something, because you really hit it from two different perspectives, which I find fascinating. And, and what brings this up is being vulnerable is scary, mm -hmm. right? Like, am I gonna be rejected? Like, how's this gonna go? Um, and when it's on the internet, it lives forever. Yes. I've deleted one post and that was it. And everything else has stayed as an embarrassing example of what I used to do <laughs> or how I used to talk. And, but it's important to have those mile posts to look back and see what you've learned from right. mistakes that you've made. Um, but fear in general, it's a huge motivator for me. And it's, it took me a while to recognize that emotion and push towards it rather than just hightail it That's in the other direction. Tell me about um, that. Like as a, you feel it coming on and, it, and it, it is a trigger to go into a habit loop of like, okay, I'm scared, now I'm gonna move forward. It's a trigger to stay put because my natural inclination when I'm afraid of something, especially when it comes to business, is to just move away from it. Mm. It's to literally shut the door, peace out, I'm done, I don't have to do this anymore, this is too hard. And I, as I've gotten older, I've realized, oh, that's, that's the green light that says, here's a thing you need to pay attention to. And I do think a lot of that is just from like going through therapy and talking to somebody who can help you understand that those are the challenges and those are actually hidden gifts. Those are things that if you figure them out and untangle all those like gnarly threads that are knotted together, you will learn something so valuable. So I may not be like aces at figuring it out right away, but when I feel that moment of this is terrifying to me, I'm like, I have to do it. And that happened with the book I just wrote because I was supposed to write a totally different book and just never did it and had called my accountant and I was about to give my advance back. And I said, I, I just, my heart's not in it. I can't do it. I'm embarrassed I did this to myself. But then I had this moment of, well, I do know what I really actually want to write about and I know what I want to talk about and like wrote this proposal with my wife and just sat down and then I didn't want to turn it in. And I thought, no, 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 I, I can't actually have the thing I want. Like, this is too good and it's too much of what I actually want. Wow. So I'm, I'm sure that if I turn this in, I'll be rejected. Mm. And I, it would hurt too much to fail at something that really, really mattered to me. And so I was paralyzed for like 24 hours and just sat there and stared at it and thought, what happens if I do this and it doesn't work out? This will hurt too much. But then I heard myself saying that, and I was like, you don't feel like this this often. This is a good thing for you to feel. You need to be scared. You need to fall on your face. You, you need to take big swings and see what happens. And thankfully it worked out, but that was a good reminder that I needed to do things more often that scared me. Yeah, and I've, I've read the book. Thank you for sending a oh, copy. Oh, thanks. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, when you said, hey, I want to do this totally different book. They said, that's great, how oh, fantastic, it's amazing. Uh, you still have the same deadline. Yes. Which gave you only a couple which months, two right? Which was months, yeah. How did you write <laughs> that book in two months? It was, that book was fueled entirely on passion and teamwork. The expression that it takes a village has never been truer with the project. Mm -hmm. um, I, in, in two weeks, came up with all the women that would be in the book. And the goal of the book was to be as inclusive as possible and representation was the goal. And so for me, that meant reaching out to people who maybe didn't have that feeling from Design Sponge because inclusivity has, and representation have never been our priorities until like the last few years. And so I was reaching out to people who 
didn't feel like they had felt at home on my site before and I had to undo a lot of damage that I had unknowingly done. Right. And I had to reach out to people who had no idea who I was and just constantly explain why they should even consider being a part of this. Um, and that process all happened like just around the clock, 24 hours a day for two weeks until we signed everybody up wow. and then booked a just totally ludicrous amount of plane tickets and just ran around the country interviewing as many people as possible. And honestly, that process, I'm glad the book is coming out, but that process was almost more valuable than the book for me wow. because talking to all these women at various stages of their career from ages like 19 to like their early 80s, mm. there were still so many commonalities between the teenagers and the people with just so much life experience that it was so wonderful to be reminded that everyone still feels scared of things all the time. Like no matter how much success they've had, they still make mistakes. Right. They still, you know, make terrible business decisions and have to fix them. And that was such an important lesson for me to learn at that point in my life. And I'm so excited to be able to put that out into the world for other people to read. Yeah, what I really responded to was here you have this like insane breadth of women, right? Just different types of people from, tatted up suits, <laughs> traditional flowery dresses, every body type you can imagine, every race, ethnicity, everything. I mean, it was just, just spectacular in scope. And the humanity through line is so, like you were saying, like you see these themes of things that you're dealing with in your own life. And even as a guy, I'm like, I can relate. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like there's so many just universal principles that even in and of itself just showing that even in this tome where we've gone all over the place and interviewed people you would think would have nothing in common mm -hmm. and you see these through lines it really was quite profound i think i hope everyone has some version of that experience because i really do feel like there's been something missing from the business especially business for women book community because so often women in business are represented as these kind of like power bitches but in like a sexy cool way like oh like lady in a sharp suit like telling people off and like hashtag, hashtag and everything and being real cool and like for a lot of people that is their reality of being a woman in business and then for a lot of us that could not be further from the truth and I thought it was important that all or more of those women were represented but sure. it was really important to have people who bootstrapped people who are very honest about having like their families fund their business um, people who are on their third fourth fifth career people who've had projects spectacularly fail and I think all of us in that book in general learned more from failure than success and that's always been something I've held really true and it was kind of nice to see that confirmed that everybody really was like I had to mess this up in order to figure out what I really really wanted to do um, and I think it was Mary Going who runs this wonderful sort of um, like genderless suiting shop. In she's in the book in like this beautiful yeah. suit. She's incredible. And she said, I think her pull quote was, you have to be willing to be really bad at something before you can be good at it. And that's really, really true. And I think if you're too afraid or too embarrassed to make the wrong decision, it's probably not the right, the right field. You've got to want it so badly that you're willing to fall down or trip or make the wrong decision or say something you shouldn't say to figure out the right way to do it. Um, and I heard that echoed over and over again. And it was just, it was this nice communal moment of, of not commiserating, but just kind of recognizing that no matter where you are in life, there will be these universal hurdles and struggles. And the sooner you can realize that it's not a track you can get off of, it's just a track you can learn how to better navigate. That was really important. Yeah, one of the coolest comments I've ever gotten about Inside Quest was um, this fairly young guy, probably early 20s, said, uh, Tom, you've communicated a very dangerous idea to me, and that is that there's no difference between me and Elon Musk other mm -hmm. than a set of skills. And I thought, yeah, if that's what you get, like, then this was all worth it. Because for people to read your book and realize all of these women who have done just incredible, astonishing, amazing, beautiful things, they're just like me. Right? They were so passionate about what they were doing, they were willing to fall down, they were willing to learn from that, they weren't afraid to be embarrassed, they, they'll scrape themselves back mm -hmm. up off the pavement and keep going, and that, that is absolutely astonishing, and it's so cool that you captured that, and it really, um, it's surprising if you know you on the surface, and it is inevitable if you've really dug into who you are, and so that's been pretty fascinating Thank to watch. You. Thank you. That's a very nice compliment. Well Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it means a lot to me. And I feel like with blogs, I mean, 
let's be real, blog, who knows what's going to happen to blogs in the sure. next few years? And I think everyone always says, like, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? And I'm like, will blogs even be a thing in five <laughs> years? I don't know. And that's a horrible thing to say as someone who makes their living off of a blog. But I feel very sort of realistic about the future of that particular platform, or at least as a sole platform. And I think writing this book was, for me, a really good time to sort of open a new chapter of what do I care about? What about my job feels important to me now? And for me, it's always been about the platform and expanding it and sharing it with people. And design has become a smaller and smaller portion of that, and that upsets some people. But for me, it, it just feels like the only way I know how to move forward. And writing this book was just such a wonderful exercise and sort of dipping my toe in what's next and what feels real and authentic for me now. And, you know, I was 23 when I started my site, and now I'm 35, and it's anyone else in any type of job would have a fundamental, you know, identity shift in that time period. So I think it feels, I feel happy and ready to see what comes after blogs. I love the way you relentlessly self-assess and the way that you're unfazed by change. Here you are, you make a living as a blogger, and you're like, will it even be here in five years? <laughs> uh, with no sense of anxiety, and I'm sure somewhere it's because you've processed through that, and I'm not saying it didn't happen, but um, change management, being excited for change, is an interesting characteristic you have. All right, last question. What's your definition of a life well-lived? Uh, one where you don't look backwards a lot. I think I spent a lot of my early years looking back to see, have I gone far enough? Have I changed enough? Will people remember me a certain way? And I think the days when I'm the happiest is where I'm present and quiet and maybe looking a little bit forward, but for the most part, never looking over my shoulder to see if I've achieved enough to make someone else happy. So I think for me, life well lived is just being in the moment. It's awesome. Thank you so much for having Grace, me. Thank you so much for coming. It was absolutely incredible. And please, by all means, like, give this lady a round of applause. Absolutely incredible. That was, that was amazing. So you've got the book coming out. Where can they get it? Anywhere books are sold. <laughs> <laughs> it's called In the Company of Women. Uh, it, I will tell you from firsthand experience, it's amazing. The universality, the beauty of variety, hearing all of these people share something so fundamentally human uh, is incredible, and you will feel your love behind every interview, behind every photo, where they're framed, how they're posed. Everything is dripping with somebody's love and care who really cares about revealing something. Revealing something. I'm literally feeling it as I say it. It was uh, incredible, astonishing. Her legacy of work is, is amazing. Um, the best place to find you is, I would assume, designsponge.com? .com, and just Design Sponge on all the social media channels. One weird, simple word. <laughs> yes. Uh, you won't be let down, guys. Dig into her world. Any interview you can find with her, I promise, is amazing. Watching them all is just... Uh, is incredibly breathtaking. Do them in order, do them out of order, it doesn't matter, but what you'll see is the evolution of a human being who is not afraid to look within herself, to constantly change and evolve, to make a demand of herself that she grows and is always adapting to the situation. Um, and man, there's that awesome quote from Charles Darwin that it's not the strongest of the species that survive, it is the one most adaptive to change. And that is Grace Bonnie in a nutshell. She is ever adapting, ever changing, finding ways to connect with herself first and everything else second. And her art and artistry is all an outpouring of clearly a deep desire to discover something within herself. This is all actually how I felt researching you, by the way. Um, discovering something in herself and bringing it out. And it will make you think about yourself and wanting to discover something in yourself. Uh, it's an utterly astonishing journey that I invite you all to take. If you haven't already, guys, be sure to subscribe to the show. We are out there trying to find amazing people like this that will change your life as they are certainly changing mine. It's a weekly show. Until next week, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Grace, thank you so much. Thank you. an absolute pleasure. Hey everybody, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Inside Quest. We don't take a single listener for granted. As you know, our goal is to pull as many human beings out of the matrix as humanly possible. And to help us do that, if you like this episode, please go to iTunes, leave a review, like it. And if you loved it, which I know you do, 
please share it with people. The more people that we can get paying attention to the show, the more guests that we can get on and the better that we can serve you guys. If you want to become an insider and you want to get access to exclusive content, be sure to go to InsideQuest.com, sign up for the newsletter. We put stuff in there that isn't available anywhere else. Uh, We promise not to spam you or waste your time. So be sure to go there and sign up. And then we're super active socially. So if you guys want to follow me personally, you can do that at at Tom Bilyeu. My last name is spelled B as in Bravo, I-L-Y-E-U. And of course, you can follow at InsideQuest as well. Engage with us. Let us know what you think. Send in guest submissions. And oh, dear God, please If you're in the Los Angeles area, we want you to come and sit in the audience and be a part of this community. It's amazing to get a chance to meet everybody. So come on in, say what's up, and let's let's change lives. All right, my friends, until next time, be legendary. Take care.